Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, your daily dive into the news. And today, we have another wild day of news to talk about. Just filled to the brim with things that we have to talk about and that y'all want to talk about. So as always, you just hit that like button to let YouTube know you like these big daily dives into the news. And let's jump into it. This is a news show. We've got a big but quick update regarding the Ava Chris Tyson, Mr. Beast situation. Because as this whole scandal has grown around the accusations of her inappropriately messaging a minor and all the fallout and old clips that have come out since, a lot of people have been going, well, where's Jimmy? Asking what is Mr. Beast's response to all this? Because it doesn't seem like it's going away. And we ended up getting an answer last night because he posted, over the last few days, I've become aware of the serious allegations of Ava Tyson's behavior online, and I am disgusted and opposed to such unacceptable acts. During that time, I've been focused on hiring an independent third party to conduct a thorough investigation to ensure I have all the facts. That said, I've seen enough online and taken immediate action to remove Ava from the company, my channel, and any association with Mr. Beast. I do not condone or support any of the inappropriate actions. In closing, I will allow the independent investigators the necessary time to conduct a comprehensive investigation and will take any further actions based on their findings. Which is a big and notable announcement on its own, but also because it seems very different from what Ava said. Because she very much framed it as a mutual decision. She wanted to protect the employees of Mr. Beast. But that said, in general, we saw a mixed reaction to what Mr. Beast said. So I'm supporting Jimmy saying you did what's best. Thanks, Mr. Beast. Now back to improving the world one video at a time. Meanwhile, you had others slamming him saying, we don't believe you, you knew disgusting. But also one of the most notable responses came from Lava, right? The person Ava was initially accused of acting inappropriately toward when he was a minor. Of course, as we've mentioned, he has maintained that he is not a victim and Ava didn't do anything wrong with him outside of making edgy jokes. And he responded to Mr. Beast saying, I commend Mr. Beast for taking this situation seriously and hiring a third party investigator while also taking the appropriate actions of cutting ties with Ava. And saying, while the allegations involving my name aren't true, I feel there is still a lot of other allegations that deserve to be investigated thoroughly. And then, okay, so this is the last show before the Olympics start, right? Well, yesterday, you know, I was just kind of geeking out about kayak cross and talking about what I'm excited about. We should also talk about some of the concerning drama or just drama in general related to the game. So first off, we gotta talk about the fact that a convicted child rapist is competing this year. With that being Steven Van de Velde, who's a 29 year old beach volleyball player for the Netherlands. And in 2014, a few days before his 20th birthday, he raped a 12 year old British girl. Reportedly, he started talking to this girl on social media, Skype, Facebook, Snapchat, spoke to her almost every day over a few months. And then in August, he boarded a flight to meet his victim in person. He took a taxi to the town where she lived and he raped her. It has been described as he had sex with her in some reports, but this is a child. He raped her. And with this, finally in 2016, he admitted to three counts of rape against a child with a UK judge then sentencing him to four years in prison. And there, that judge actually telling him, quote, your hopes of representing your country now lie as a shattered dream. Your actions in those two days in England have wrecked your life and you could, had you never come to England and committed these offenses, have been a leader in your sport. But obviously, as we're seeing now, those hopes actually haven't been shattered in the slightest. I mean, starting with the fact that he only got a four year sentence to begin with, and he actually ended up spending less than half that time in prison, serving just 12 months in the UK before he was transferred to the Netherlands under a treaty between the countries. And there he was re-sentenced to a shorter term under Dutch law, serving one more month before being released. And so he's actually been back competing on the volleyball tour and in international competitions for several years, even getting married and having a kid. So while things have been smooth enough, of course you have the Olympics here and it's put a spotlight back on this case like nothing else. And understandably, a lot of people asking how the hell the IOC could let this happen. And well, to that point, it's basically because the IOC doesn't have its own rules for the selection of athletes, or they let each country make their own decisions. And so with that, the Netherlands Olympic Committee has simply said the guy served his sentence and completed an extensive rehabilitation program, as well as claiming that experts have concluded that there's no risk of him reoffending. But with that, you have people like Ciara Bergman, the CEO of Rape Crisis England and Wales saying, if you can rape a child and still compete in the Olympics, despite all athletes signing a declaration promising to be a role model, that is just shocking. And adding there, there is always an impact on the individual victim survivor, but every act of violence against women and girls is a crime against society. It is a collateral and collective impact on all other women and girls. And then you also have groups like the Survivors Trust adding to that in a statement saying, the rape of a child was planned, calculated, involving international travel, and will undoubtedly cause his victim lifelong trauma, irreversibly changing the course of her life. As a society, we have to start embracing a zero tolerance approach to this heinous and costly crime. And as far as my 
opinion, uh, I mean, you know it. I don't think he should be anywhere near the Olympics unless he is buried underneath one of the courts. But then, you know, like I said, this is just one of the stories around the IOC and the Olympics. Because the IOC is also getting a lot of heat for a situation that has to do with Russian and Belarusian Olympic athletes competing in the Olympics, being accused of supporting the war in Ukraine. And that's a big deal, not only because fuck Russia for the war in Ukraine, but also because it's technically not allowed. Right? There are actually IOC rules banning any athletes who are actively supporting the invasion of Ukraine or who have served in Russia's military from competing. And so with that, Russia and Belarus have been banned from sending official teams to Paris at all because of the invasion in Ukraine. With instead, people with Russian or Belarusian passports having been allowed to apply to compete as individual neutral athletes if they meet the requirements. So that's why there's only 15 Russian athletes this year when in the past, they've typically been one of the largest Olympic teams. Like in Tokyo, for example, they had more than 330 athletes competing. But then with that, you now have a human rights law firm claiming that out of just those 15 athletes, 10 have violated the rules allowing them to compete. With the firm specifically saying the athletes that either like social media posts supporting the invasion of Ukraine, competed in pro-war competitions, or were members of military-linked sports clubs. Like one Russian road cyclist, for example, liked an Instagram post from a month after the invasion featuring an image of Joseph Stalin with a caption saying, a truce with the enemy is possible only after its destruction. And with that, a legal advisor for the firm behind the report also accusing the IOC of making statements about peace and human rights without taking action to support them. Specifically, saying the IOC is more than happy to try to let these things blow over because the IOC is profiting from a system where it understands that it can claim to be pro-human rights. It says athletes represent the values of peace, dignity, but then it doesn't actually put in the work to ensure the Olympic Games truly represents that. But then also we have to talk about how there's drama around the Olympics having a spying scandal hitting women's soccer right now. Right, it has to do with the Canadian women's team, which notably is the team that won gold three years ago in Tokyo. And so basically the spying was apparently someone flying a drone over a couple of the New Zealand team's practices. With someone obviously spotting the drone, they then reported it to police, and then the police were able to track down the operator, who ended up being Joseph Lombardi, who is an unaccredited analyst with the Canadian women's Team. Now with that, the Canadian Olympic Committee came out with a statement saying that they were shocked and disappointed. And with that, offering their quote, heartfelt apologies to New Zealand football, to all the players affected and to the New Zealand Olympic Committee. And on top of that, Lombardi, as well as the assistant coach responsible for him, were actually sent home. You also had the Canadian head coach denying any involvement in the scheme, saying that she would step aside for the first game against New Zealand anyways. But still, with that, you had the New Zealand football CEO calling for urgent action to be taken to address this integrity breach. With him saying to hear now that the Canadian team had filmed secret footage of our team training training at least twice is incredibly concerning and if not treated urgently, could have wider implications for the integrity of the tournament. But then finally, we gotta talk about the future of the Olympics. So not the next one, the, the one that's still 10 years away. Because just yesterday, Salt Lake City was officially chosen to host the 2034 Winter Olympics and Paralympics. But now already, you have Olympic officials threatening to move them elsewhere. And it turns out it's because the US's continued efforts to investigate allegations of Chinese doping. Because if you don't remember, some elite Chinese swimmers have tested positive for two banned substances in the past. And while the World Anti-Doping Agency reviewed those results, they kept them secret, with the athletes then allowed to compete in 2021 at the Tokyo Summer Olympics. And the agency there is saying that it chose to accept the Chinese government's explanation that repeated positive tests for performance-enhancing drugs were actually the result of accidental contamination. But this is US drug testing experts and many American athletes as well have rejected those explanations. And so we've got this bipartisan group of US lawmakers calling for an investigation, saying it is imperative to assess whether these alleged doping practices were state-sponsored. And then actually earlier this month, the Department of Justice opened a criminal probe into all of this. And so all of it has led to a series of statements from top IOC members criticizing US officials for not accepting the previous findings. And in an unprecedented move, the IOC demanded that officials in Utah, along with the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee, sign a contract affirming, quote, respect for the authority of the World Anti-Doping Agency in exchange for this week's agreement to hold the 2034 Winter Games in Salt Lake City, which is absolutely fucking wild. But with any and all of the news that we just talked about with the Olympics, of course, I'd love to know your thoughts on it. Let me hear from you in those comments down below. And then in big legal slash drama news, Andrew Tate just got a massive win, or he didn't, depending on who you ask, though it seems like generally this is a win. I'll explain. See, Andrew Tate may still be stuck in Romania, but his lawsuit in the US, it's moving forward, right? Andrew Tate and his brother Tristan, they were arrested in Romania back in 2022 and indicted last year on charges that include human trafficking, with the Romanian authorities saying the Tates forced seven victims into pornography and also subjected them to violence. But then also last summer, the Tate brothers brought a defamation lawsuit against one of their accusers in that case, a Florida woman, with them claiming that she has falsely accused them of human trafficking and rape, causing them to lose both their freedom and millions of dollars 
dollars in income. And they also alleged that she enlisted another woman in a plot to extort the Tates for money. So on the other side, you have the woman's attorney saying this lawsuit, it's just retaliation against her for going to the authorities. But now the big news is that the judge in the case, Palm Beach County Circuit Judge Joseph Curley, has allowed the suit to proceed, though significantly narrow. See, Judge Curley said that the Tates attorney has shown enough potential evidence that the woman defamed the Tates and attempted to extort them to warrant proceeding with the case. And there, he specifically pointed to text messages that could indicate that the woman knew she was falsely accusing the Tates of sex trafficking and false imprisonment. However, Curley also threw out parts of the lawsuit that accused the woman of false imprisonment for the Tates' arrest, as well as the bits about intentional cause of emotional distress and interfering with her business relationships. So it's also important to note that Curley has left open the option for Team Tate to amend and refile those accusations. Notably, the Tates also claimed the woman's parents defamed them when they told American officials about their daughter's allegations. But we saw Curley throw that out as well, saying that the parents had no reason to believe their daughter's claims were false and had the right to report them. We also saw the judge dismiss the accusations against the second woman allegedly recruited to help extort the Tates, though the specifics there matter, because she is a Moldovan citizen living in Great Britain, meaning that she's outside Florida jurisdiction. Now with all this, you had the Tate side saying they're quote, most pleased with Judge Curley's ruling because the suit addressed the quote, plot to destroy Andrew and Tristan Tate's lives. Andrew Tate also celebrating the ruling on Twitter, announcing the decision and saying she lied. And the Tate's attorney responding, we are brothers united in the great fight of good versus evil. The truth cannot be stopped. We will leave no stone unturned in the pursuit of your freedom and in the mission to cleanse your name. God is with us. But then also with this, you had the organization representing the women, right? The National Center on Sexual Exploitation Law, also calling this a victory, saying we are very pleased the court has tossed out the majority of this frivolous lawsuit and wisely narrowed the issues and claims. And adding, if the case proceeds, we look forward to the opportunity to prove the truth of what occurred in Romania, and we are confident that ultimately we will succeed and this harassing lawsuit will fail. So as far as when all this will happen, we don't know. We still don't have a trial date yet. We probably won't for a while. Right? And that is because between legal challenges and discovery, when each side shares information about the case, it could be years before a date's set. And that's if one set at all. But notably, like what we know here is that this is going better for the Tates in their last defamation case. Because earlier this year, a federal judge dismissed their defamation allegations against a U.S. Marine sergeant whose reports of human trafficking reportedly led to the Tates' arrest in Romania. And this news today is also coming hot on the heels of an appeals court overturning the ruling that allowed the Tates to leave the country, which means that they're still confined to Romania while they await trial. But as far as what happens from here, we're gonna have to wait to see. And then, y'all, foundational health. That's what I think about when it comes to my body and my mind. And today's sponsor, Momentus, is a respected brand ensuring that you're getting essential nutrients for foundation health, right? Momentous creatine, omega-3, and protein taken daily provide essentials the body needs to help function at its best, like aiding in cognitive function to reducing inflammation in muscles and joints. And while supplements can feel like a dirty word and navigating the space can be daunting due to the lack of trust and transparency, I've come to learn that Momentous is dedicated to working with the best, from their collaboration with experts to their unparalleled commitment to only using the highest quality ingredients. And they invest heavily in third-party testing, right? Holding their products to the standards set by the most demanding organizations in the world, including the NFL and NBA, ensuring that what's on the label is what's in the product and absolutely nothing else. You know, they call it the momentous standard, which is really the industry's leading standard in quality. You know, there's a reason why the world's best athletes and experts use and help develop momentous products. So if you like me and you want to take supplements that are made by and used by the best in the world, go to livemomentous.com and use code DeFranco for 20% off. That's livemomentous.com with code DeFranco. And then, why are y'all making me talk about this? This was the most requested story today. JD Vance and the media are in the midst of a pretty big scandal involving his sex life. Because back when JD was announced as VP, which was only nine days ago, despite it feeling like four years, someone put on Twitter that JD Vance admitted to fucking his couch in his book, Hillbilly Elegy. With that, then spreading like wildfire, even here on YouTube, with you guys making edits of couches over romantic music with JD Vance. But this whole thing, in fact, getting so big, the Associated Press had to fact check the whole thing, and they put out a headline saying, no, JD Vance did not have sex with a couch. But then that actually set the whole journalism world ablaze, because how could they definitely state that? Because technically, they can say that J.D. Vance never wrote that he had sex with a couch, but they can't say they 100% know for sure that J.D. Vance has never smashed a couch. Because technically, they don't know that. Which is actually why the Associated Press then retracted their fact check on whether J.D. Vance is a couch smasher or not. Because their post, it didn't go through their standard editing process. And all of this coming during maybe the worst nine day stretch of Vance's life with it being speculated and rumored that Trump's gonna dump him because of the absolute shit show that he's brought with him. With an ever growing number of videos coming 
out of J.D. Van saying things like the country is being run by childless cat ladies who are miserable at their own lives and because they don't have kids, they don't have a direct stake in America. Also saying if you don't have kids, you should have less of a vote. And I mean, that's just one of several opinions that have rubbed many people the wrong way. But I mean, this one, it's drawn wide denouncements from around the country, but perhaps none as big as Jennifer Aniston, who wrote, I truly can't believe this is coming from a potential VP of the United States. Mr. Vance, I pray that your daughter is fortunate enough to bear children of her own one day. I hope she will not need to turn to IVF as a second option because you are trying to take that away from her too. But going back to the main point of this short, to our knowledge, J.D. Vance has not had sex with a couch and it is not his fault that his face makes you think that maybe he did. That's more of a you problem unless it is actually true and then it would be the problem of a very qualified upholsterer. And then, did you know that every year the federal government launders tens of millions of dollars for the worst drug cartels in the world? I'm not kidding. The Drug Enforcement Administration does this, but also like not as a pro bono service for the cartels. Instead, it's a tactic that they use to get their foot in the door. You launder 100,000 and you can figure out who dropped off the money. You work that person higher up into the organization. You find out who the traffickers are. You do bank subpoenas, you find out where the money is going. Right, so the hope is, in the end, you arrest some high-level people and you seize a lot of the drugs and the cash along the way. Or at least, that is supposed to be how it works. But what happens if corrupt agents, I don't know, they skim some cash off the top and they use it to, I don't know, if I was gonna guess, bankroll a worldwide pursuit of binge drinking and illicit sex? No, I didn't come up with that scenario off the top of my head. That is exactly what a ring of dozens of DEA agents and prosecutors did for years in the mid-2010s, according to thousands of secret documents obtained by the Associated Press. Press, right? And these assholes, they apparently call themselves Team America, and their ringleader, Jose Irizarry, he held no illusions about what he was doing. With him explaining his motive, saying, you can't win an unwinnable war. DEA knows this, and the agents know this. We know we're not making a difference. Right? So he figures, well, why not milk it for all it's worth? DEA is a game. The drug war is a game. We, it was a very fun game that we were playing. And so here's how it worked. The agents would organize a trip to some foreign country that they wanted to go to, usually on some flimsy excuse like interviewing people or talking to local cops. Then they'd have agency staff wire funds to international accounts that they controlled, spend that money on themselves and falsify reports, which then would justify the next spending spree, then rinse, wash, and repeat. And I mean, the lives that they lived, they quickly began to resemble the lavish style of the drug kingpins that they were supposedly investigating. With them, for example, partying on a yacht full of booze and sex workers in Colombia, flushing away thousands of tax dollars at a strip club in the Dominican Republic, scoring dinners at a fancy restaurant and tickets to a soccer match in Madrid, even buying jewelry from Tiffany luxury sports cars, a nearly $800,000 home, and a personal boat. And then we sprinkled in a couple work things in there, but it was a more of a party first, work second type of deal. And so after five years of tapping what they referred to as their debauchery piggy bank, the agents had just five convictions to show for it. But what's more concerning than the wasted money is the roller coaster of sexual depravity that eventually culminated in rape, right? And we know about that because the AP obtained logs from a WhatsApp chat with five agents, one of whom still works with the DEA today. And in that, they joke about creating a hooker app in which agents would sneak prostitutes past everything from a hotel front desk to DEA internal affairs while trying to avoid federal prison. Some of the text reading, like in 2017, one agent writing, Jose, you're just smashing ass. Nothing wrong with that. Under Trump, you're good. And then another message an agent told them he was, quote, hoping you've organized some welcome pussy for me tomorrow when I land. Also going through the text, anal apparently held a special place in their heart. In fact, so much that they coined a term for it, pancaking. But the big thing is that all of this apparently wasn't just like locker room talk. With the AP finding at least two references to assaulting sex workers and leaving it to an informant to clean up the mess. Which brings us to an agent by the name of George, a then 38-year-old married man who took a 23-year-old woman back to his government funded hotel room in Spain. With her telling the AP and investigators, I told him very clearly that I didn't want to have sex. Adding that she was on her period that night, but then according to her, he forced her to have anal sex with him. But then even locking herself in the bathroom before fleeing the hotel through the fire exit in a state of utter shock. And the police and the paramedics, they found her with bruises around her wrists and George very drunk. So he gets arrested, he's thrown in jail, but within hours, the DEA swooped in for the rescue. With the agency chief in Spain calling the command center outside Washington, notifying three dozen officials in total, including that then acting administrator Robert W. Patterson. And so you saw the U.S. Embassy sending officials to the jail, and within a day, George was released without bail, with then the judge dismissing the case six weeks later at the prosecutor's request. And after just a brief internal probe and suspension, George went back to work with only a letter reprimanding him for showing, quote, poor judgment. Meanwhile, the DEA, they never spoke to the woman he allegedly raped. In fact, the ranking official in Spain, they didn't even have her contact information, nor do they appear to have even tried to get hotel surveillance footage or medical exam results. And in the meantime, you have this woman saying she has severe panic attacks now, they've 
forced her to drop out of college. And to this day, she is still haunted by fears that her attacker is going to return. Now, to try to be fair to the agency, once Irizarry got caught, it began investigating all this misconduct and all the corruption a little more seriously. With then George refusing to testify before a grand jury, with him then being stripped of his gun, badge, and security clearance, with him then resigning. Meanwhile, Irizarry got arrested in 2020, and he's currently serving a 12-year prison sentence. But so far, no criminal charges have been filed against anyone else involved in this operation. And this, even though more than a dozen have been quietly disciplined or ousted from their jobs. And so years later, you have people just waiting to see if accountability means anything in the DEA, but uh, it also has many asking, well, why would it now? But then let's take a moment to nerd out, right? Because scientists just made a discovery that could change our entire thing about the origin and fate of life on Earth. And its name is dark oxygen. See, researcher Andrew Sweetman actually first discovered this back in 2013 when he picked up unusual oxygen readings from the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. But at the time, he was just like, damn it, my equipment's malfunctioning with him. Also then later telling CNN, I basically told my students, just put the sensors back in the box. We'll ship them back to the manufacturer and get them tested because they're just giving us gibberish. But he then later realized it was anything but gibberish. Right? Because a few years ago, he and his team returned to the Pacific, having confirmed their sensors were 100% fine. And once again, they lowered one 13,000 feet down to the ocean floor. And what they found is that instead of decreasing, the oxygen levels increased, suggesting that more was being produced than consumed. Which of course brings in the question, well, what the hell is producing all that air? And well, their hypothesis is polymetallic nodules. These potato-sized rocks formed over millions of years, and they contain minerals like uh, cobalt, nickel, copper, lithium, manganese, and iron. Right? So the researchers, they believe that the interaction between those elements actually produces electric chemical activity, breaking down the surrounding water into hydrogen and oxygen. Which understand, if true, would totally upend our understanding of how life came to exist in the oceans and really on Earth in general. See, because scientists, I mean, they've long assumed that oxygen was only produced through photosynthesis, right? When organisms like plants and algae convert CO2 into it using the sun's energy. But of course, 13,000 feet below the surface where these nodules are, there's no sunlight. Hence the term dark oxygen. Now, as cool as that is on its own, this discovery is also big for another reason. It also carries some heavy implications for the deep sea mining industry. Right? you have environmentalists fearing that if we start pulling all these minerals out of the oceans, we could destabilize the ecosystem in unpredictable ways. You know, just like how chopping down rainforest deprives the earth of a crucial source of oxygen, deep sea mining could have the same effect. Though also, ironically, the same properties that make those nodules produce oxygen also make them crucial for batteries, which is why you have the mining industry arguing that extracting them is actually necessary to create green energy and stop climate change. Hence, the, the fate of life, or at least human life on earth, could in part depend on how we handle this discovery. So yeah, uh, big news and a uh, Thank you for letting me nerd out for a minute. And then, y'all sleep is major, like for everyone, fat. And if you're struggling turning your brain off once your head hits that pillow, you're tossing, you're turning, or you're waking up multiple times throughout the night, listen up. Because our fantastic partner, the PDS Beam Dream, it's made with the highest quality sleep promoting ingredients to help you and me unwind from busy days and get the deep sleep that we need and deserve. I mean, I've been using Dream for years now and I can also say it saved my ass last night. I was feeling like there was no way I was gonna wind down, but it's become this bedtime ritual for me that I look forward to nightly. You know, with it, I really like that it doesn't make me feel groggy come the morning. Instead, I wake up feeling refreshed and ready to take on the day. Also, there's no added sugar and it's only 15 calories with a lot of delicious flavors to choose from, like peanut butter, their original flavor, cinnamon cocoa, white chocolate peppermint, which is also one of my favorites. And just one scoop of Beam Dream is clinically shown to help you fall asleep faster, sleep through the night, and wake up refreshed. Also, yeah, maybe it is a hot summer night and you don't want to drink something warm. Dream over ice or Beam's Dream capsules, they're a great option. Plus, they're great to have when traveling. So y'all, go to shopbeam.com slash DeFranco and use code DeFranco or scan the QR code to get up to 35% off with my exclusive discount. That's shopbeam.com slash DeFranco and use code DeFranco. And then, the biggest police force in the world, the NYP the, the recipients of a, a lot of criticism have a fun new problem. The disciplinary records of NYPD officers just keep mysteriously disappearing from the website that allows the public to track their misconduct, which is something that of course has raised serious questions about police accountability, legal compliance, and even potential efforts to obscure wrongdoing. And this especially because the website was literally created following pressure from the George Floyd protests to increase transparency and accountability. And all of this got revealed in this wild ProPublica report. As the website in question was built after New York state lawmakers repealed a state statute in 2020 that had banned personnel information about officers from being released. And that move was widely applauded by civil rights advocates who had long argued that the law effectively allowed police to hide misconduct records from the public for decades, which was making the state a national outlier. And you even had the NYPD themselves patting themselves on the back when they complied with the statute's reversal and published a searchable database of uniformed officers early the next year, all of which gave the public the ability to search for certain cops and see information about their training histories, departmental awards, and internal discipline records. With NYPD brass even touting the website's launch in an agency-wide memo claiming that the move was a, quote, 
step that increases transparency and improves accountability. But now we have this ProPublica investigation revealing that the database championed by NYPD is shockingly unreliable, with them reporting that disciplinary cases against officers frequently vanish from the site for days, sometimes weeks at a time. And it's not like we're talking about some small blip in the system that was quickly resolved after the initial launch. In fact, when the website was first launched, access to these cases stayed relatively steady. And that's according to a thousand daily snapshots of the database's contents that ProPublica analyzed. But since the fall of 2022, the number of discipline cases that are accessible to the public, they have repeatedly disappeared and the number of publicly accessible cases fluctuates often and wildly. And sometimes when an officer is searched, the website will literally issue a message that says the officer does not have any applicable entries. And key thing, that's even if they do in fact have a disciplinary record. Now, Notably here, it is possible that some of the missing cases involving former officers may have been removed over time because the database is only meant to show misconduct records for active officers. But even then, you had ProPublica saying that those would only explain a fraction of the missing cases. And also, the most concerning part about all this is the sheer number of misconduct records it's impacted. Right, I mean, since May of 2021, just two months after the database was launched, almost 90 fucking percent of the disciplinary cases that had appeared on the NYPD site had gone missing at some point. And while some were ultimately restored at a later date, the issue you still persist. Hell, even the same week ProPublica published this story, they found that more than half of the cases that had been in the system at one point were missing. And beyond that, this investigation is also super significant because this issue doesn't just impact low-ranking officers. We're talking about something that goes all the way to the top, with ProPublica finding that, quote, the issue affects nearly all of the officers in the database, with discipline disappearing from the profiles of patrol officers all the way up to its most senior uniformed officer. And this notably including Chief of Department Jeffrey Madry, who's the force's highest-ranking uniformed officer. And that's in addition to six deputy chiefs who have assignments that include the NYPD's Transit Bureau and Joint Terrorism Task Force. And the range of the allegations against these high-ranking officers include being discourteous to a suspect, drinking while on duty, improper use of department property, and wrongful searches, frisks, and use of force. And you know, specifically in the case of Madry, he was actually docked 45 vacation days over an incident, right? One where he had obstructed internal affairs officials who were looking into an altercation between a fellow officer and an ex-lover that ended with the officer brandishing a gun at Madry. But just days before ProPublica published this investigation, the NYPD system reported no disciplinary cases against the top official. Which is why with all this, you have experts saying the investigation has brought up some super serious concerns. With, for example, Lupe Aguirre, a senior staff attorney at the New York Civil Liberties Union, saying, it just continues to undermine the public confidence and that they care at all about discipline and police accountability. Their track record shows that they are both unwilling and unable to hold their officers accountable. And then going on to argue that the NYPD just can't be trusted with the disclosure of officer discipline records because it is a long track record of resisting oversight, especially and specifically when it comes to data. For example, back in 2012, New York City passed a landmark open data law requiring government agencies to publish a wide range of information on the citywide portal, which is called open data. And experts say that with the statewide reversal of the police secrecy law in 2020, the NYPD is now required to post all of their officer data, including misconduct records on open data. In fact, an official schedule of releases shows that the NYPD's officer profile data was actually supposed to be added to the website by the end of last year. But the agency, wouldn't you know it, still failed to upload that data. And all this is despite literally being required by law to publish their records on open data, the police department chose a third party vendor to run their site. With that vendor, Rock Daisy, being best known for selling athlete management software for sports teams. And so, I mean, all of this, it's super sketchy for a few reasons. First of all, why would they hire a potentially unqualified vendor and risk issues with the platform when they already had a perfectly good government website that they're supposed to be using anyway? That is, unless, and this is a complete hypothetical, they want to use a glitchy website that made misconduct records disappear for some reason. And secondly, there's also some serious sketchiness with the NYPD's connections to the company, with ProPublica finding that the source code from the officer profile website shows that it runs on Rock Daisy software. And that also seemingly being backed up by a blog post on the company's site that said that it's software had been licensed to several professional sports teams and, quote, the world's largest police department, which, you know, seems to be a clear reference to the NYPD. But notably, that blog post, which is also linked in ProPublica's report, when we went to check it out, what do you know it, that page just happened to be taken down. Also with this, a spokesperson for the New York City agency that audits department spending and reviews city contracts told the outlet that her office couldn't locate any contracts with Rock Daisy or payments made to the company. But even that is not where the sketchiness ends. Because the NYPD also refused to respond to ProPublica's repeated requests for comment and has failed to make any kind of public response addressing this very serious situation as of recording. In fact, instead of tamping down concerns about accountability and transparency, they're taking secret steps to make future oversight even more difficult. I mean, just weeks after ProPublica revealed these very alarming issues, the NYPD quietly restored over 2,000 discipline records that had previously just gone, oh, whoops, missing. Which then resulted in the outlet publishing another article reporting that a little more than a week after their reporters reached out to the NYPD for comment, the department just so happened to begin a massive restoration. And then a few weeks after the first article came out, the agency did a full update of the website. And 
update that notably scrubbed all references of Rock Daisy from the site's source code. And at this point, you might be thinking, well, okay, they're being weird about it, but at least they put the disciplinary records back. Well, no, because in the revamp of the site, the NYPD also removed case numbers from the disciplinary data, which is a move that ProPublica says will make it more difficult for the public to identify or track missing cases. And also noting that since the site revamp, the surge in restored cases has begun to drop again. So of course, as a result, you have experts still concerned that the database is so inconsistent and that the NYPD only discloses a small subset of these cases. With Aguirre explaining, the fluctuation in the data is still concerning and reflects a continued pattern of secrecy in how the department handles disciplinary matters. New Yorkers deserve full transparency into the NYPD's internal accountability systems, especially given the department's culture of impunity. But still, even with this latest report, the NYPD has remained totally silent and refused to address any of this. Which of course, funny enough, makes it seem even more like they're hiding something, even if they weren't. So I'm also not saying that they're not hiding something. But then finally, today we have a congratulations and we gotta talk about yesterday. As far as congratulations, congrats to this week's SeatGeek prize winner. Of course, getting $500 towards any tickets on SeatGeek. And for everyone else, you can go see your favorite artist, comedian, or play using SeatGeek. Y'all, they have over like 70,000 events to choose from. And SeatGeek and The Daily Dip are still giving away up to $1,000 in tickets and you should definitely enter today if you haven't already. Or they're our fantastic partner and sponsor and all you gotta do is add code PDS to your SeatGeek app profile for a chance at the weekly $500 prize, no per is necessary. With $1,000 prizes available to Daily Dip subscribers who add code PDS newsletter, which doubles entries and winnings. But that said, as far as yesterday's comments, while going into the show, the Ava Chris Tyson story was one of the most requested things, the thing that got the most comments was the Christopher Dunn situation. He's the Missouri man who's still in prison, even though a judge ordered his release. And if you haven't seen that deep dive, I definitely recommend you watch yesterday's show. It's absolutely outrageous. And y'all definitely thought that as well. With a lot of the conversation centering around comments, like the fact that a judge can say no jury would convict this man, but we can't let him go because he's already locked up anyway, should tell you everything you need to know about how fucked up our justice or rather punishment system is in this country. Others replying, holy shit, I cannot stress this enough. Fuck anyone who blocks an accepted innocence plea with substantial evidence on literal nuh-uh grounds. Others like Thurban writing, I never had less faith in our justice system as I do at this age. Holy fucking shit, I scream no in defiant disbelief at the ruling of Christopher Dunn. A man proven innocent has to stay in jail. There is no logical reason for that. That's barbaric. I feel like a piece of my soul got scooped out just learning about it, let alone living through it. It takes a truly dead heart to do that to someone. We also had folks like John Lancaster claiming, I was a sergeant with the Missouri Department of Corrections for almost three years and an officer for two. I saw Dunn's face and immediately recognized him. He is respectful, kind, and does what he has to in order to keep going from day to day. While custody staff are taught not to look into offenders' offenses and cases, I have become familiar with Dunn's. I'm so frustrated at Missouri's gross negligence in the use of the justice system, and I hope Dunn not only gets his rightful freedom, that he gets a fat paycheck from the state afterwards. And yeah, the angry comments just went on and on and on. And understandably so, and hopefully that more people learning about this is getting more attention, it can lead to Dunn's release. Because really, based off of everything that we've seen, this is a, just a huge miscarriage of justice. Especially because the situation highlights both uh, individuals being cruel, but also how, in addition to being annoying, just how heartbreaking and devastating the bureaucracy of our legal system can be. But on that uh, delightful note, that's where today's show is going to end. I hope this show and all the other daily shows this week have made the insanity of the world a little more easy to consume. Also, with the way things have been going, I can already tell the next show is going to be a big one. So, I just want to say, I love yo faces make sure you subscribe because who knows i might have to actually post on the weekend soon but i'll leave you to your life now i hope you have a fantastic weekend and either way i'll see you right back here on monday